Let's get to CNN's political director, David Chalian. So, David, tell us what to watch for tomorrow in Georgia. Allison, you are right. Uh, governor Brian Kemp, the incumbent Republican governor in Georgia, Donald Trump's number one political target of his post-presidency. Why? Because Brian Kemp, rightly and correctly, uh, certified the legitimate and fair election of Joe Biden over Donald Trump in that battleground state that helped propel him to the presidency. But Donald Trump has been telling his lie about the 2020 election ever since, and that's what makes Kemp uh, target number one. Donald Trump may be in for a big loss here tomorrow if those pre-election polls are correct. You mentioned the Trump versus Pence factor tonight. Pence has that rally for Kemp. Trump is holding a tele-rally for Purdue. So the former president and vice president, the former running mates all in, except as you note, they are on other sides of this. They're trying to carve out their own political turf inside the Republican primary in advance of 2024. Look at this statement from Donald Trump's spokesperson today to the New York Times about Mike Pence. Now, desperate to chase his lost relevance, Pence is parachuting into races, hoping someone is paying attention. That's pretty direct and snide. Uh, so clearly, no love lost between these two, despite Pence's four years of total loyalty to Donald Trump. The other thing we're watching in Georgia are these early voting turnout records. Take a look here on the Republican side, pre-election primary votes cast thus far. In 2018, it was 172,587, okay? In 2022, 406,388 Republican pre-election primary votes. Record setting. And by the way, Democrats are coming out to vote too, even though they don't have very competitive contests at the top of their tickets for either governor's or Senate race. In 2018, where there was a competitive Democratic primary, 151,204 pre-election primary votes cast. In 2022, it's nearly 300,000, nearly double what it was just four years ago in the primary season, Allison. David, really interesting stuff. Look at that level of engagement. I mean, that just looking at the numbers is fascinating there. And I know that you're also following a Democratic race for Congress in Texas and how abortion is playing into it. Yeah, this is a fascinating race. It's a runoff between Henry Cuellar. He is the incumbent, moderate, establishment Democrat, one of the very few Democrats uh, that still portrays himself as a pro-life Democrat in the Congress. He does have Speaker Pelosi's backing as the incumbent. But the more progressive challenger here, Jessica Cisneros, running with the support of Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, when that leak from the Supreme Court came out, it injected a whole new life into this runoff campaign. And now We'll see if the pro-abortion rights candidate Jessica Cisneros can fire up enough progressives uh, to overcome the incumbent Henry Cuellar in this race. And then, of course, what that may mean for Democrats trying to hold on to the district in the fall, Allison. Okay, David Chalian and we'll be watching as we know you will be. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks. Okay, so let's discuss further with CNN political commentator Scott Jennings. He served as special assistant to President George W. Bush. Um, Scott, great to see you. Let's talk about what's going on in Georgia with Brian Kemp. So he had to today try to explain his relationship with Donald Trump, and here's what he said. I had a great relationship with, with Mike Pence. I had a great relationship with President Trump. I've never said anything bad about him. I don't plan on uh, doing that. I'm not mad at him. I think he's just mad at me. And that's something that I can't control. Okay. So number one, what do you hear in that statement? And number two, if Kemp wins bigly, as President Trump used to like to say, does that change Donald Trump's kingmaker status? Well, first of all, for Brian Kemp, I think the kind of authenticity you heard in that answer is the way he's run his campaign. And it's in large part why he's winning so big here, because he didn't try to contort himself. He didn't try to play semantics games, you know, about about how this has all gone down. He just accepted the reality, leaned into it, stated his position. And I think the voters have rewarded him for it. Governor's races are often about competence, likability, authenticity and in, in the future. And Kemp has just really uh, uh, done great in every single category. Regarding uh, the future of the Republican Party, uh, I think that was the second part of your question, Well, it was about, his, it was about I the think kingmaker that, status. Like, do you think that this is, this, his kingmaker status, Donald Trump's hinges on this? Well, I mean, look, I, I think he's still extremely influential with Republican voters. It's just in this particular case, he, run, he ran up against somebody who, who figured out how to solve the equation. It doesn't mean Donald Trump isn't an influential person anymore. 
But Kemp's also had the benefit, too, of having, uh, you know, and sometimes in the Republican Party, the way you can explain success is by having all the right enemies. DeSantis in Florida has this right now. Kemp, in many ways, has had all the right enemies. He defeated Stacey Abrams. He stood up against uh, some of the, the corporations in Georgia uh, in 2020. He, uh, you know, stuck to his guns on the Georgia election law that, you know, a lot of the national uh, liberal establishment came on, down on him for. So, even though Donald Trump was mad at him, he then cultivated some of the right enemies that I think signaled to Republican voters, hey, Brian Kemp really is one of us despite Donald Trump's opinion. So does it totally throw out his kingmaker status? No. Does it show a way to stand up to Donald Trump? Yes. And does it show the right way to run a campaign when you have this dynamic? Absolutely. People should study the Brian Kemp model. It's interesting to hear what some Republican governors are now saying about Donald Trump and how he's conducting himself in 2022. Basically, they're calling his involvement his personal vendetta tour. And uh, one of the people talking about it is former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie. He said this um, yesterday. Uh, this is not, just not the best use. OK, so basically what he's talking about is having to spend money in Georgia to fend off Donald Trump's attacks. And he says, this is just not the best use of our money. We would much rather use it in races against Democrats. But it was made necessary because Donald Trump decided on the vendetta tour this year. And so we need to make sure we protect these folks who are the objects of his vengeance. So what's the larger point here? Well, the larger point is, is Chris Christie is uh, exuding the quaint notion that political parties are about the team and about the health and future of the party as a whole. Uh, of course, he's doing that in the era of Donald Trump, who's made the Republican Party all about himself. I mean, Donald Trump doesn't think about, hey, party resources would be better spent here or there, and this is how we win more races. I mean, he, I mean, he doesn't view the world through that lens. Now, fortunately, the Republican Governors Association decided to view the world exactly through that lens. And that's the role of a party or a party committee to help the party's incumbents and the party's uh, rock star office holders win election. And in Georgia, that's a big deal because Stacey Abrams is one of the top Democrat recruits in the country. She will not lack for resources. So every dollar we've thrown away in this uh, useless Republican primary is a dollar and we could have spent in the fall. That's a really good party strategist way to look at it. And that's what Chris Christie has been in his career. And uh, I'm glad he's standing up for that point of view because it strengthens the party when people do that and it works. I'm not sure that Congressman Mo Brooks is following your credo about the team because, as you know, he's running for uh, Senate in Alabama, and he is doing so by going after uh, your longtime uh, boss and colleague, um, Mitch McConnell. So let me uh, read to you what he says. Mo Brooks says on Twitter, uh, we only have a couple more days until the primary election. Remember, this election is a battle between Mitch McConnell and the swamp versus grassroots conservatives. Is that a winning strategy? Well, I mean, Mo Brooks's problem is, is that Donald Trump was for him and now he's against him and uh, bailed out on him. <laughs> and, and he's trying to make this race about something else. I don't think it's going to be a winning strategy. That race has gotten interesting, though. You know, Brooks had fallen back and now the latest polling shows him rising. It seems like we're headed for a runoff in Alabama. Actually, for all the races Tuesday night, Alabama Senate is one of the most interesting. It's one of the closest races. It's got some of the strangest dynamics and, and really, uh, I think, one of the best candidates in the country and Katie Britt that the Republicans could nominate. So I'll be uh, up in New York for election coverage Tuesday night. That's one uh, I'll be watching closely because I think it may say quite a bit about uh, where the Republicans are headed in the fall.